Good night, everybody. And tonight's Tale from the Tent is from 1913. And the author is Catherine Tynan. About 1872, on a suggestion of an old friend of my father's that I was running wild, it was decided that I should go to a convent school. And the one chosen for me was Siena Convent Drogheda. The matter, apparently, was urgent, for I was sent there in mid-vacation and came to a green garden place of quiet restfulness with no work doing and no pupils remaining except a few whose parents were at the ends of the earth. It was a good August, and we sat around the grounds with the nuns, doing such things as pleased us, talking or reading if we would. The established pupils had their strips of fine embroidery, their needlework of various kinds. I came to the convent with the reputation of being a great reader, and I was asked many questions about the books I had read. It was a far cry from the novelists of the day and earlier to the reading of the only light literature the school library contained. There were the guileless novels of Lady Georgina Fullerton, the heir of Redcliffe, the Fabiola of Cardinal Wiseman, the Callista of Cardinal Newman, Adelaide Proctor's poems, and a little volume of verse which had a great vogue in mid-Victorian days. It was, as well as I remember, by the author of Easy Kyle, Easy Kyle, being, I presume, an earlier volume. It would be seen that the nuns were not illiberal, since there were two Protestant authors to four Catholic in this little list. Whatever honey was to be got out of the convent library, I sucked and sucked dry, and began over again. These worldly volumes were, by the way, reserved for holidays and feasts. On ordinary days, if we had a book, it was of the spiritual kind. One sucked one what honey one could out of a prettily written history of England and out of the hour or half hour's reading of a story book at night before prayers. A nun read aloud and we clustered about her with our fancy work to listen. We had the air of Redcliffe in this way and the other romances. I don't think they were ever added to, so when the list was exhausted, it began all over again. When the nun came to a passage of love making, there were several in the air of Redcliffe. She would turn very red and laugh, or she would say with contempt that what followed was great nonsense. The result was the same, for the love making passages were huddled away out of sight to our extreme disgust and disappointment. For other reading, well, we had the lives of the saints read aloud to us at meals, we taking it in turn to perform that duty. I don't think I derived much enjoyment from that reading. The lives were dryly told, except when I myself was the reader. I enjoyed thoroughly taking the floor, as we call it in Ireland, and thought I read much better than other people. But someone must have written the legends of the saints, not dryly, for, for from these convent school days I carried away a store of beautiful legends, and I don't think I dig them out of Alban Butler. At this convent school we got the Bible in the shape of a dreadfully dull Bible history. No honey to be extracted from that at all. I believe the real honey of those days came by my observations of the life around me. Everything about the convent was very old-fashioned. No newspapers were allowed in to disturb the convent atmosphere, no magazines, nothing of what was happening outside in the world unless it came by word of mouth. The nuns talked, as doubtless they do today, of out in the world as though it was the other side of the world. That aloofness was never more justified. There was something medieval about the convent. The nuns were excellent musicians and linguists. They taught the ordinary subjects with ordinary success, I imagine. But the progress of the world had stopped for them some 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years before. 
their books were old fashioned. I well remember the intense indignation of the most capable of all the teachers when, on her telling her class that the source of the Nile had never been discovered, 10 years old, fresh from the newspapers of her vacation, cut in with, oh yes, Dr. Livingstone discovered its source in Lake Victoria in Nyanza. And pray, who is this Dr. Livingstone? Mother Alphonses asked, shaking her veil, an incontemptuous indignation moving to something else. A very simple curriculum indeed. But what was it they did teach that was better than much learning? What was it that brought the gentlest, tender, tenderest, loveliest of their pupils flying back to that white piece of the convent from a rough and coarse world? What was it that made the most unworthy of their pupils, one with a keen eye for their simplicities, resolve that a girl of hers should go nowhere else but to a convent school? It was the heavenliness of the convent atmosphere. I can find no other word. Many outsiders have remarked on the grace, the beauty, the refinement of Irish girls of the shopkeeping and farmer classes, qualities not always shared by their brothers. Something, of course, is explained by the ups and downs of Irish history, which have reduced the descendants of the old families to the Carrams and placed the sons of the freebooters in the castles. But the convent schools afford the fullest explanation needed. Whatever of ladyhood is in a girl, the convent school fosters and brings to perfection. Good night, everybody.